This evening we'll be discussing the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita which is entitled Conclusion, the Perfection of Renunciation. So this is the last chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. In every chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna stresses that devotional service unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead is the ultimate goal of life. This same point is summarized in this 18th chapter. In every scripture, every Veda, devotional service is the objective. That is explained in Bhagavad Gita. So this uh, chapter begins with a question by Arjuna. Since the Gita stresses renunciation of material activities and engagement in spiritual activities, Arjuna asks Krishna to explain definitively the purpose of renunciation and the purpose of the renounced order of life. Renunciation is called Tyaga. Renounced order of life is called sannyasa. So Arjuna is asking Krishna, please tell me what is the purpose of Tyaga, what is the purpose of sannyasa, what is the purpose of renunciation and what is the purpose of the renounced order of life. Now Krishna's reply to this most important question by Arjuna is there in the rest of the chapter. This is the biggest chapter in the Bhagavad Gita because it summarizes the contents of the entire Gita. The first 17 chapters, what was discussed, is summarized here. So we'll be doing this chapter in two sessions, today and tomorrow. So today I'll cover about half the chapter. Now Krishna's reply to this question, Krishna first of all says, what is sannyasa? Renounced order of life or sannyas means giving up activities that are based on material desires. And he replies, what is renunciation or what is tyaga? He says, giving up the results of all activities is called renunciation or tyaga. So once again, sannyasa is giving up of activities based on material desires. And tyaga or renunciation means to give up the results of all activities. Now Srila Prabhupada explains Krishna is Krishna is essentially telling here the performance of any activity for the sake of enjoying the results has to be given up. This is the instruction of Bhagavad Gita throughout. But activities which are meant for spiritual advancement, they should never be given up. Now, what is the reason Krishna is telling this? Because <clears throat> it was explained earlier, work should be done as sacrifice to avoid bondage. Sacrifices are mentioned in the Vedas. But in the Vedas, there are many, many different types of sacrifices which are mentioned. So, some of the sacrifices are meant for attaining a good son or attaining the heavenly planets, etc. Some 
material gain, some material benefit. So here Krishna is telling uh, sacrifices like these which are meant for getting some material benefit they have to be stopped. They should not be performed. However, there are other types of sacrifices mentioned in the Vedas which are meant for purification of our heart, which are meant for spiritual advancement. Such sacrifices should not be stopped. So, Krishna further says, according to learned sages, there are two kinds of opinions. All one set of learned sages say, all kinds of material activities are faulty and therefore they should be given up completely. So one set of sages say, give up or stop all kinds of material activities. Another set of sages, learned sages, they say, Sacrifice, charity and austerity mentioned in the Vedas should never be given up. So, there seems to be a controversy here regarding what is mentioned in the Vedas as regards sacrifice or charity or austerity. Uh, for example, Srila Prabhupada explains, the subject matter of animal killing. Now, animal killing is mentioned in the Vedas, especially in sacrifice, some type of sacrifices. Now, there are sages who say animal killing in sacrifice is okay, it is not sinful. Some other sages say, all types of animal killing should be completely avoided. Animal killing is sinful. Now, Srila Prabhupada explains that why do they say that animal killing in sacrifice is okay? Because if a sacrifice is performed with the help of a qualified priest, then the animal which is killed for offering in the sacrifice is revived after the sacrifice. So the animal actually is not losing its life. Or in some cases, the animal which is killed and the sacrifice performed by sacrificing the animal in the fire, sacrificial fire, that soul gets immediately the next birth as a human birth. So the soul is promoted to the human form of life immediately. So that is also very, 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 very beneficial for the soul in that animal body. So it is in this light that Animal killing in sacrifice is said in the Vedas to be okay, not sinful. But when some sages say that animal killing is highly sinful, you should not indulge in any type of animal killing. What they are meaning is that to find a qualified priest who can chant the mantras in such a way that the animal which is sacrificed will be either revived after the sacrifice or will be promoted to the human birth. Those type of qualified priests are very, very rare to find, especially in this age, in this Kali Yuga, in the present age. Therefore, they say animal killing is sinful. If the animal is not revived after the sacrifice or if the animal is not promoted to a human form or human birth immediately after the sacrifice, then the animal killing is definitely sinful. So now this clarification now Krishna is going to give regarding sacrifices, charities performed or regarding austerities done according to the Vedas. Krishna says, 
that sacrifice, charity and penance must be performed without attachment and without any expectation of any results because such a way of performing any sacrifice, any charity or any austerity mentioned in the Vedas, it purifies even the great souls. So, uh, the purpose of any sacrifice, any charity or any penance, any austerity should be purification of the soul. And to purify the soul, such sacrifice, charity or austerity must be mentioned in the Vedas. It should be done without any attachment and it should be without any expectation of any kind of results for the performer. So, regarding renunciation, Krishna next speaks about renunciation, sannyasa, sorry, tyaga. Tyaga means uh, renunciation. <clears throat> he says, renunciation, there are three kinds of renunciations according to the three modes of nature. We have uh, uh, Understood, there are three modes of material nature, goodness, passion and ignorance. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. According to this, there are three kinds of renunciation. So first he describes what is renunciation in the mode of ignorance. Tamasic renunciation. Tamasic Tyaga. What is that? Giving up prescribed duties because of illusion is called Tamasic Tyaga. Then, next he describes uh, renunciation and passion or rajasic tyaga. Renunciation in the mode of passion. What is that kind of renunciation? Giving up prescribed duties out of fear or giving up prescribed duties as troublesome. Just like people many times, some Vedic injunctions, scriptural injunctions, they don't follow because it's very big botheration. Just like scriptures say, to practice spiritual life, rise early in the morning. But especially nowadays, because people, due to different reasons, they work late in the night or they work very hard. They're unable to get up early in the morning. So they don't rise early in the morning for any spiritual activity. They think it's troublesome. So such kind of giving up of prescribed duties out of the uh, uh, idea that it is troublesome, such a renunciation is called renunciation on the mode of passion. And then what is renunciation in the mode of goodness or sattvic renunciation? When one performs prescribed duties with regulation, giving up all material association and attachments to the results, such a renunciation is said to be renunciation in the mode of goodness. That's what Krishna described earlier, that, that uh, any sacrifice, charity or austerity also should be done without any attachment and without any expectation of any result. Same way, renunciation which is uh, in mode of goodness is performing prescribed duties, not stopping work, but performing one's prescribed duties as given in the scriptures, giving up all attachments and without any expectation of any results for oneself. This is renunciation in the mode of goodness. And this type of renunciation is recommended by Krishna. Renunciation in the mode of goodness. Not renunciation in the mode of passion or ignorance. No. So, now regarding a person who is a sannyasi or one in the renounced order of life, Krishna says, an intelligent renouncer in goodness has no doubts about his work, 
because he is neutral to inauspicious work and auspicious work he doesn't discriminate now people sometimes hesitate to do something thinking that it may be the work itself may be inauspicious or they are very very eager excited to do something which they think is very very auspicious for them now all these considerations of inauspicious and auspicious uh, types of work is based on whether it is beneficial for me or not beneficial for me whether it is favor going to give me some favorable result or it's not going to give me any thing which is favorable for my enjoyment no so this consideration is not the proper consideration for either doing some work or not doing some work the proper consideration is whether it is a prescribed duty mentioned in the authentic scriptures authorized scriptures and if it is prescribed duty authorized mentioned in authorized scriptures then i should do it regardless of whether i consider or i think it is auspicious or inauspicious because i should do it without attachment and i should do it without any expectation of results now what is the benefit then at all is there any benefit at all why should i do it without any expectation of any reward because doing in this way will result in purification so that i can make spiritual advancement to ultimately to get out of this material existence which is full of miseries uh, which is a temporary existence which is constantly changing nothing is permanent i can get out of this material existence material world and go to krishna's personal abode for eternal life full of bliss full of knowledge permanent eternal existence so that is the reason why there are prescribed duties prescribed means you must do it and you must do what is said there 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 is no question of whether it is favorable for you or unfavorable for you whether you get what you desire or you don't get what you desire no so not everybody is uh, actually situated in proper perfect knowledge about what is the aim of life what is the ultimate goal to be achieved when we have this human form of life the vedas are meant for human beings so the vedas are recommending specifically some duties to be performed uh, as compulsory or rather i would not say compulsory as prescribed that means you must do it because the ultimate goal is to be achieved by performance of such activities but while doing such activities if the desire is there that i may get something for my enjoyment now then we may miss the ultimate goal or we may not do the activity according to the recommendation in the scriptures we may do it in a different way than what it is supposed to be done and then the ultimate goal is missed or we do not make spiritual advancement so that is the danger therefore prescribed duty should be done exactly following the rules and regulations as it is said in the scriptures for the ultimate goal of attaining krishna's a personal abode at the end of this life and not becoming bound up in this material world now one important thing krishna says is that renunciation doesn't mean stop all kinds of activities 
doesn't mean stop all kinds of activities. Because already it's explained in the third chapter by Krishna that nobody can be inactive even for a moment. You may say that some lazy people don't do any work at all. Simply sit idle. How do you say they cannot be inactive even for a moment? Now, activity or work is performed through the body, through the mind and through words, through speech. So, if somebody is not working through the body or not physically active, they cannot stop mental activity. Everybody is always active in the mind. Even when we go to sleep, we are active in the mind. That's how we have experience of dream. That is because the mind is active even when you are sleeping. So mind is always active. Therefore, when it is said, you cannot be inactive even for a moment. You are always active. At least you are always active in the mind. And the mind, through activity of the mind, we are actually uh, motivated to perform some activity through speech or activity through our body, physical activity. It drives us. The mental uh, faculty, the mind drives a person to act through the body or through speech. Therefore, there is always activity of one kind or the other through either the mind or the speech or through the body. So it is true that nobody can be inactive even for a moment. So it is not possible to be inactive. Therefore, one has to do activity. But what kind of activity? Because if we are not doing the right kind of activity, then we become bound up in this world. So to avoid bondage, uh, we have to do prescribed duties as prescribed in the Vedas, authentic scriptures, without attachment, without any expectation of any results for ourselves. So that is the perfect way of doing detached work. Then Krishna explains according to Vedanta philosophy, there are different causes for accomplishment of any action. A little technical here, but not difficult to understand. I'll still try to explain this. That there are five factors for accomplishment of all action. Any action to be successfully done or performed requires five factors. So the first factor is the place of action. Unless there is a suitable place or a situation for an action to take place, the action cannot be accomplished. For example, if you are trying to light a fire using some firewood, the firewood has to be dry. You cannot light a fire. Supposing I had to cook. Of course, nowadays we don't cook using firewood. But let us say somebody, formerly at least people were using firewood for cooking. Then they cannot start cooking by lighting a fire with firewood, if the firewood is wet. So, the successful accomplishment of lighting a fire uh, is possible only if the wood is dry. Similarly, you require a favorable place or a f just like you are trying to light a lamp and it is very, very windy oil lamp, supposing you want to light. It's very windy. You cannot light it. The wind is not allowed. So, the situation or the place has to be proper. Then the performer, there has to be a performer, a person who does the action. Without a performer, no action can take place. And the various senses which are described as the instruments, just like 
if I do some work, I have the working senses. Every person has got hands, legs, the organ of speech. These are our working senses. So a person wants to lift something, he requires hands, he has to use his hands. So similarly, uh, it is explained here, the senses, the instrument senses are required, the instruments are required. And the different kinds of endeavor, cheshta, different kinds of effort for different kinds of activity. Just like uh, if somebody wants to do a painting, uh, they, should they should be able to actually do that painting with some skill. Hmm? A particular type of endeavor is required for painting. Another type of endeavor is required for typing. Another type of endeavor is required for maybe operating a machine to do something. So, like that, different kinds of endeavors are there for different kinds of activities. And ultimately, this fifth factor, many people miss out, is the super soul, Paramatma, whose sanction is absolutely required for accomplishment of any action. If he does not sanction, then the action will never be accomplished. So people sometimes wonder, what did I do wrong? Why was I not able to successfully do something? Now, they may consider one or two or three or four factors, but they miss out the fifth one. So Krishna is pointing out, right or wrong, whatever a person does, by body, by mind, or through speech. It is possible to do the activity only if all the five factors are favorable. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Action is not going to take place. So, most important is uh, the sanction of the Supreme Lord as Paramatma, as Super Soul. So unless an activity is sanctioned by the Lord, it's not going to be accomplished. No matter what other um, efforts or endeavors or arrangements or skill you may have, whatever you arrange, however nicely you want to do, however expert you may be, it's not uh, going to happen if the sanction of the super soul is absent. So therefore, an intelligent person considers if he wants to be 100% sure that he'll accomplish some action, then he understands that what should be attempted to be done should be according to Krishna's own directions, what should be done. Hmm. So Krishna's directions are given in the Vedas. Vedas are giving us what are our prescribed duties. Therefore, performing prescribed duties is guaranteed success, both in terms of accomplishing the action and in terms of getting the ultimate result or the desired goal of life. The desired goal of life, ultimate goal of life, is to get out of this material bondage, material entanglement in this world and to go to our original home uh, with Krishna, in Krishna's personal abode, where we belong actually. So that is accomplished 100%. Success is achieved by doing prescribed duty. That's why Krishna says, perform prescribed duties as given in the Vedas. Because Vedas are given by Krishna. That's why. And Krishna is the ultimate sanction. Now somebody may say that uh, there is a person who wants to do something very, very wrong or bad. 
if, if the super soul ultimately has to sanction any activity, why does God as super soul in the heart of a, of a criminal sanction doing that criminal activity? Simple, no? God can uh, clean up this whole world simply by not sanctioning any criminal activity because ultimately the action won't take place. Supposing I want to harm somebody. Can I harm if super soul does not sanction? No, I cannot. So that would be very nice, no? Very neat, no? No. There are considerations. What kind, what, which activities the super soul will sanction and which activity the super soul will not sanction. It is not so simple consideration that all good activities, he will say, very good, very good. You should do good activities. So if you desire or if you want to do something good, I will say, okay, you can do it. If you want to do something bad or something wrong, something sinful, I will not sanction. Because anyway it's wrong, anyway it's bad, should not be doing that. It's not that simple. Why? Because we should remember, we have come here or we have been forced to come here. It's not out of choice that we have come here, we have been forced to come here. Because we desire to be independent of Krishna. We desire to uh, do things without any, any, any consideration of whether Krishna uh, prescribes that or Krishna does not prescribe it. Or we want to be just forgetful of Krishna. Or we want to be independent of Krishna. Or we want to imitate Krishna. Different reasons like this are mentioned in the scriptures. Why? Uh, we are forced to take birth in this world. So, under such circumstances, even though Krishna's sanction is required, whatever anybody wants to do, even in this world, still, his sanctions happen according to certain laws. They are called the laws of karma. So, according to the laws of karma, whether good activity or bad activity, sinful activity or pious activity, that which is sanctioned, uh, that which is prescribed in the scriptures or that which is against scriptural injunction, whatever anybody wants to do, if that doer or performer of the action is not a devotee of Krishna, then Krishna does not personally involve in sanctioning the sanction happens according to the laws. So the laws of karma, according to the laws of karma, everybody is able to do some activity, all those who are not devotees of Krishna. The vast majority of the people in this world are not devotees of Krishna. So the vast majority of the people, they are able to do some activity or not do any activity based on their karma based on the laws of karma. The laws of karma state that according to whatever punya I have accumulated, I can do certain things and according to whatever um, papa I have done, I am forced to suffer that which I do not like. So, what I want to do, I can do, or what I desire to do, I can do, provided I have punya. And what I don't want, or what I don't like, or what I don't uh, desire, will be forced on me, if I have done papa. So, everyone has got, generally, everyone has got some punya and some papa. So, according to punya, Whatever they desire to do, if the punya allows, they will be able to do it. And whatever suffering they undergo is forced on them because of their papa. So this punya and papa, we are accumulating every action we do. Every action we do. 
and we have been doing activities in not only this life in the past immediate past but in the past lives several lives millions of lives we have been doing punya and papa punya we have been doing different activities either knowingly or unknowingly good or bad pious or impious but we have been doing and we have been accumulating punya and papa and we are expanding that when we desire to we are expanding punya when we desire to do something for uh, our own benefit hmm? something which we desire to acquire or something which we desire to do some good activity etc and some things are forced upon us some suffering some pain some insult some loss some injury some disease is forced on us nobody wants disease nobody wants to suffer nobody wants pain nobody wants any kind of suffering but it is forced because of papa so this punya and papa is enforced without any partiality equally on everyone all those who are not devotees everyone it is enforced as regards devotees uh, the scripture say that moment one becomes a devotee means one surrenders to krishna accepts the process of bhakti and simply follows krishna's instructions uh, prescribed duties as mentioned in the scriptures without attachment only for the sake of pleasing krishna without any desire for personal gain if one performs then punya and papa will not be the consideration krishna will sanction only uh, those activities which are beneficial for me for my spiritual advancement and krishna will not sanction any activity which is not beneficial for my spiritual advancement and krishna will personally involved in every case as per my so we have uh, uh, discussed about this particular um, aspect of the five factors of action so tomorrow we will uh, do the rest of the chapter thank you hari krishna